Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sustainable Retail, Preparing for a Greener Future. My name is Jan Fletcher. I'm Director of Finance and Commercial Policy at the British Property Federation, trade body representing investors in UK real estate. Now, the race to net zero is definitely on, and the next few years we'll see widespread investment needed in retail property to make sure that it's as carbon neutral as possible. This is going to be a very difficult task, and a lot of challenges lie ahead, so we're going to spend the next hour or so on this topic, um, starting with some of the big structural changes happening in retail and again what these might mean for carbon emissions, moving on to some of the tightening government regulations in this area and increasing investor pressure as well, before tackling what's probably the most challenging bit of this whole question, which is how do retail property owners and occupiers work together to make sure that retail property is fit for a greener purpose. And then we'll wrap up with a bit of a forward look. So what can we see changing in this space and what more could government do to help? And we want the session to be useful to you. So please do use the Q&A function to share your thoughts and questions. And we'll definitely do our best to tackle these as we go along. We've also got a couple of polling questions lined up for you to consider. And then these will again help to inform our debate as well. Now, to navigate these topics, I'm delighted to be joined by some excellent panellists who I'm going to ask to introduce themselves, giving a, a very short, maybe a one minute summary of why this topic is important to them. And if we could go, Chris, Emma, Greg and Rob, please. Chris, over to you. Hello, good morning. I'm Chris Paul. I'm a partner at Crowns and Hamlins. Um, I sit in our project and construction team and I head up the firm's cross-departmental energy and sustainability group. Um, you know, as a firm, we're seeing the rise of net zero 2050 and ESG criteria across a wide range, range of transactions. You know, it's obviously in the property space, it's coming into corporate transactions very clearly. And certainly in terms of the construction and, and new build, it, it's, it's certainly driving how we build better and, and uh, you know, issues of the cost uh, and the, the carbon footprint of building. The sort of work we do, lot, lots of advice on things like district heating connections and concessions. Uh, supply agreements, uh, on-site renewables, uh, private wire, uh, and financed and non-financed retrofit. So th th there's a there's a huge space of work here. Why we find it interesting as lawyers, obviously the the, the government's uh, regulations are ever changing. It's a, an effort just to keep up with the amount of consultations that have been going on. And we have things like um, you know COP26 coming, which is driving government policy to be seen to be doing things, which is all great. But there's obviously a huge level of change happening. So so for lawyers, it's a very interesting space to be in. Uh, and, and certainly we're interested for our client base who are either as landlords uh, or, or have retail spaces. Um, it, it's a really important area. Thanks, Chris. Emma? Good morning. My name is Emma McKenzie, uh, and I'm Head of Asset Management and ESG at New River. So New River um, is a listed entity. Um, we're a real estate investment trust, and we own 33 community shopping centres, but 25 retail parks and over 700 pubs. So suffice to say, it's been a very challenging year. But um, what we have experienced and continue to experience is the, um, the greater emphasis on ESG and the, you know, the social side um, of our ESG programme has always been absolutely core and fundamental to our whole business model and um, the whole social aspect of what we do, particularly because we're community based. But the environmental side has definitely um, gone up the radar, not only internally, but externally for us. And although we've had you know, a comprehensive ESG programme for over five years, the, the emphasis on environmental is, has really ranked up. And the challenge that we face is really the age and nature of our estate. And, and we're, not, we're not new developers of new space that we have an existing um, portfolio, much of which was built in the 80s, 90s um, and the last 20 years. So there are challenges that face us with all of that. And also just from, from an investor side, there is more, there's increasing pressure from our, our shareholders and investors as to what, they are, what our agenda and how, how we're addressing it, and particularly around materiality. And again, that is definitely gone up the radar in the last kind of 18 months, two years, is to um, the visibility we have on the material impact on our business model. Um, and of course, that falls into the funding markets um, and the capital markets. So it's, um, it's a very, very big piece of our business uh, modelling uh, going forward. It's a subject that's close to our heart at New River. Thanks, Emma. Greg? Good morning, all. Thanks. Uh, my name is Greg Jones. I'm a director at Hawley. I'm one of the leaders in the sustainability group. And we work across a, a range of different sectors, really retail being uh, one of those. We've been doing a lot of that work in, in recent years. Uh, and actually work across both consulting as a group of uh, engineers and consultants, but also in, in the ESG space, helping clients understand their own ESG strategies and, and pathways. And I guess from our perspective, you know, why is this topic of interest to us? We've been considering what societal changes may mean for the future of retail. Keen to understand a bit more of that, maybe get into that conversation today. Thanks, Greg and Rob. 
Hi, Rob Butterworth, Senior Property Manager at ASTA. I'm principally uh, responsible for looking after ASTA's lease renewals um, for its occupied estate, as well as managing with a, a team the um, income producing estate across ASTA. So sustainability is high on my agenda. And the particular interest that I have is the um, emergence of the green lease clauses and how what these mean for occupiers as well as landlords, because that affects us in uh, both ways. Uh, with my role at Asda. Thanks everyone and, and thanks very much for making time to be with us this morning. Um, <clears throat> let's start with some of the big issues, so the big picture. You know, retail sector has been changing for years now, um, driven by the gradual inexorable rise of online shopping and, and of course other factors as well, um, many of which have been accelerated by COVID. So before we dive into the sort of energy and sustainability side, perhaps a, a few words from uh, Emma and then Rob on what is this looking like for different parts of the retail sector and, and what more can we expect? Um, well, I think you I mean, think you're right. Um, there's been change in retail for the last 20 years. It's not over the, you know, just over the last couple of years that we've seen seen what we're seeing, but um, certainly the last 18 months has accelerated what was what was happening, um, and which is, is a positive thing because there's a lot of businesses, certainly as a business, we, you know, we, we were not um, um, completely shy of all the, the administrations and CVAs that happened, but a lot of those businesses that have what had, had distress were in distress before COVID and really that just kind of pushed, the, pushed them over the edge. So, uh, and we've seen the number of CVAs and admins really tail off in the last six months. So, um, which just demonstrates that point. But a lot of that, um, a lot of that distress from those retailers came from the oversupply issue that um, you know, they had too much retail space in too many towns all around the country. And by the nature of retailing and, uh, and, and you know, the shift to online, they just did not require that space. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of town centre space that, that that's excess, um, and it's not so prevalent in the retail warehouse market. So that um, as the retail warehouses have been built over the last twenty odd years, the town centres have have suffered with with too much space. So that um, so that was happening beforehand. What's what's accelerated it in the last eight month, eighteen months is obviously COVID, and um, and what what is positive from it is that the emphasis that is on high streets and town centres now, and the amount of funding that's coming into that. And again, that had kicked off um, beforehand. Um, I mean, the High Street Task Force, which I sit on the board of, that was all established and had been recommended by government before COVID. It's just it's had a very, very much greater role than, than anticipated having. But that's a positive because um, we have leapt forward four or five years. There's a huge amount of government funding come into it. And also, more importantly, people's lives and, and how they live their lives has changed. And many aspects of that will not change. And it don't, not only affects retail, it, it affects um, the office sector, the logistics sector and the, and the residential sector. So positively, what we will continue to see is, um, is people shopping more locally um, and living and spending, you know, the whole working from home, um, I think, is here to stay in some capacity. So a couple of days a week, people will be in their, in their homes in which case they will use their local towns more, they'll use that retail more. And what we'll see from that oversupply is a much more multifunctional town centre emerging um, with a multi multitude of uses, whether that's civic uses and leisure uses and medical uses and residential, et cetera. That will, that will start to emerge and already is emerging from, from where we are just now. And it's much more forward looking in the last six months than it was this time last year when it felt like kind of survival mode, whereas um, I think there's a lot of positive um, opportunities um, exist for for all, um, all all users of space, both occupiers and landlords. But it's um, it's going to take time and it's going to take funding, and the whole environmental aspects are, are very much part of all of that. So, uh, Rob, some thoughts from you? Yeah, I mean, COVID's really accelerated uh, the online demand. That demand was always present, but it's been pushed forward, you know, three to four years into the future in a very short space of time. Asda's focus throughout COVID was on convenience and safety for customers. We looked to double our on online capacity um, across the last 12 to 18 months. So that's the significant scale of the shift for our business. But then that, to Emma's point, creates other opportunities because uh, in the reverse, then we've started to adapt the way that some of our stores work by introducing different partnerships uh, to drive back in-store traffic. So we've introduced partnerships with Greg's, McDonald's, the Entertainer, the Catalog, I mean, into some of that space in store, which might not be required anymore. But in addition to that, in terms of the local offers, uh, because we run quite a large non-occupied um, non estate, 
what we're seeing is demand from those local services to echo as Emma's point from the barbers, the hairdressers, the nail salons, all those services that you can do online, which need great space next to a fantastic footfall, uh, um, which we offer uh, relatively competitively in comparison to other locations. So we've seen a really good growth in demand for that sort of location, that sort of space, which we think adds to the vitality of these um, neighborhood centers in many cases. And, and that's really the, the shape of things to come, that these, these centers will get stronger um, as we go along through this crisis. Thank you both. I, I think we're going to start diving into the sustainability side of the equation. And I think it's time for our first polling question, if we could have it up, please. Do you think that online retail creates carbon emissions that are more or less or about the same as their equivalent physical retail? So do we think that online retail is effectively greener than, um, than physical retail or not or about the same? If you have to answer the second question as well, then please do so. We'll come on, we'll come on to that later in the in the webinar. What uh, what what do our panelists make of the results on the first question? If I can come in on on that piece, Jan, I think forty six percent of panelists are suggesting that there are more emissions as a result of online sales as opposed to physical, and I, I think. Maybe that's not so much the energy consumed by buildings in storing stock and fulfilling customer demand. Maybe it's linked with the transportation of those goods to people's homes having made the purchase. And I can understand that thought process. Mm -hmm. I guess if you were to bundle into the, the counterpoint, people's own emissions in traveling to town or city centers to buy the goods, then, then maybe it's equivalent. And, and maybe that suggests, you know, 38% of people saying about the same, and maybe it is about the same. The key difference in my mind is you know, the likes of Amazon and, and others are moving to fully electric fleets much more quickly than the individual in, in the marketplace is currently, albeit the uptake of EVs is, is, is skyrocketing. So maybe currently it's about the same, but as time progresses, we'll see the online offer becoming more carbon efficient than the traditional mode. I was just going to add a thought about um, you know, the, the buildings themselves, the fabric. I mean, the you know, we're, we're talking about emissions from a from a supply chain. Um, and I suppose the question is, how easy is it to measure some of these emissions? And do we have the data to really know what's going on? Um, I suspect, you know, some of these fit, fit within that sort of scope three emission that is quite, quite ethereal sometimes, and we don't often have the data for it. Um, if you compare, um, you know, your, your out of town sheds, um, um, your, your, your supply chains for online retailing, you know, they're, they're, they're most likely to be more modern builds in a high street. You haven't got the historical fabric. You haven't got the difficulties of you know, listed buildings to deal with. So they have got, got the ability probably to make things much more energy efficient uh, than perhaps the high street retailer does. So I, I think, again, it, it's, it's, it's not comparing apples with apples generally. And I think it's very hard to, to draw easy comparisons between you know, online retail with physical retailing. I think that's absolutely right, Chris. Where there are opportunities with those sheds is, for example, deployment of rooftop PV, which would be very difficult in a more urban context on historic assets that Emma made reference to earlier. And for some work we were doing just recently, actually, on those logistic sheds for a typical fulfillment centre, uh, you know, a large single volume shed, by covering half the roof in PV, you can offset almost all of the electricity consumption in a, in a regulated sense, not quite all of the true energy consumption, but the opportunity there to meet the electrical needs of the building through on-site PV is much greater than what would be the case in an urban context. I mean, I agree, I think, uh, with both of you, I think it just demonstrates how complex the whole area is um, and how um, non-binary is just absolutely littered with both um, challenges and opportunities, the whole area. And it's, you know, for businesses like ours, it's being able to recognise both it's, um, and being able to, to be visible and demonstrate that we're aware of not only the challenges, but the opportunities that exist and that we're on a pathway that we know who we want to try and get to um, and that we have to work collaboratively to try and achieve what we can achieve because um, there's no business um, that can do this on their own. Um, on the subject of complexity, then, it sounds like a good point at which we move on to looking at some of the tightening government regulation around this. Greg, are you OK to take us through some of the myriad things that, um, that, that the owners need to think about these days on, on the sustainability side of things? And sorry, before you do, just a thank you to those who are posting questions on the q and I see there's two up there now and we'll definitely get round to those. Thank you. Keep, keep posting. 
Thank you. And so you're absolutely right. There are you know, a myriad of different things it seems to be aware of. So I won't go into all of them in, in a great level of detail, but maybe a quick overview of some of the key points. So I'm, I'm sure everyone on the call will be familiar with uh, the MEES standard and, and the current EPC minimum for lettings. And, and the consultation that suggests that by 2030, that is going to uplift from E to B. So uh, Emma, to your earlier conversation point around existing assets and existing historic buildings. There's a real challenge there, isn't there? But what, what would we do to improve the efficiency of those buildings? So maybe there is uh, what we're certainly seeing in other sectors, a flight to quality of disposing of older, harder to modernize assets and, and moving into spaces that are ready and fit for the future. Linked to that, we've seen the consultation on the future buildings standard, which really is a stepping stone towards a net zero carbon outcome. And it suggests that really there's a move towards you know, greater electrification across the whole of the built environment. Actually, retail has largely been electric for the most part for quite some time, maybe with the exception of A3, which is used gas for, for cooking, but generally for a typical uh, retail environment is largely electrically driven. Um, the other thing to be aware of, I think, is you know biodiversity net gain. Uh, we're seeing with the Environment Bill a target of a 10% increase in biodiversity for um, new developments. Uh, what we're actually thinking of actually is not just quantity, but the quality of that provision as well, and what kinds of habitat spaces could provide. Uh, again, maybe there's greater opportunity in suburban or peri-urban sites than there is in historic city centre urban locations. But even there, you know, taking a Wild West End in London, for example, there's great opportunity for providing greenery in existing places and linking those things together to provide wildlife corridors. And I guess to the earlier conversation on, on societal impact, People are much more aware now, I think, about the built environment and its relationship with the natural realm and how we can safeguard both the need for places for people whilst making sure there's space for nature. At a higher level, there's the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure and, and the broader ESG drive. I think reference was made earlier to investors and continuing questions on what are the sustainable outcomes your business is seeking to achieve? And maybe beyond that, um, you know, the UN Sustainable Development Goals are seeing increasing focus and attention at all levels on making sure that businesses have defined purpose, understand what they're aiming for. And uh, what we're seeing from our clients is questions that say, well, help us define a strategy that means we can uh, respond to our investors positively and, and show all the things that we are aiming for. Thanks, Greg. If I could just turn to Rob for a moment. I mean, there's, there's quite a lot there. Um, how useful is it and, and how, how, what kind of impact do you think it will have making businesses like yours more, more energy efficient? Yeah, well, Aston's got very strong ESG credentials. have issued our first ESG report. But for a complex business like Asta and its complex supply chain, it's not, not necessarily all focused on property. Um, you know, the, the EPC methodology that they have today and the, and the way that we grade buildings, that will cause, to everyone's point, some issues uh, with some of our older stock that we have. And upgrading them might not be the most cost-effective thing to do. So we, we think that there should be a different view, potentially put on EPCs, to your point about how we look at how we consume electric in these buildings. So... By 2025, Asda's ambition is to procure 100% um, green energy, but that's not necessarily reflected in an EPC grading. Um, and that's these are some of the, short, the shortfalls we think in current government thinking. Uh, some of the things that we, we would promote for EPCs because the, the standards are going to we'll look to change in the future is possibly that making a, a grace period from when you let a building to when you occupy it to allow the occupiers to come in potentially and do a fit out, which would increase the EPC rather than having to do that before you can actually let a building, uh, which would be unlawful in the current regime. So some really sensible but targeted um, changes to the current EPC guidance we think would be really helpful, not, not just for landlords, but for occupiers as well. I mean, that the work isn't undone, potentially I've done twice. Thanks, Rob. Um, Emma, your perspective on this? Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, in, in principle, I think government regulation around all of this whole area is, is, is going to be essential, isn't it, to try and ensure that actually change happens um, and that both, both occupiers and owners are both engaged in the process. And it's like anything, some of it's beat with a stick and leap with a carrot, isn't it? It's got, it's got to come from both ends. Um, because from our perspective, um, you know, we've got a, a 
comprehensive ESG strategy. We've been on that path for a long time, but we've, you know, we've recently just this year just announced our pathway to net zero and articulated um, uh, the, the kind of scope of, um, of what we are doing in the pathway to that. And a big, big part of it, obviously, for us is our, the nature of our estate is that we do not control the space, the vast majority of our space. So in retail parks, we control virtually none of the space. We, you know, we control the lighting pretty much. Um, and in a shopping centre, that's significantly different. We control, obviously, the common parts. But the vast majority of space is occupied by the retailers, and, and yet we are responsible for having EPCs for space that they occupy and, and operate. So there's real challenges um, in, in, you know, ahead for, for owners around that. And that's, that's a not, you know, before we touch on the cost of all of this. So, um, so where that cost lies and who it lies with and, um, and how that, uh, whether it's service charge items, I mean, retailers are all over us in terms of our service charge and mitigating costs is right at the top of their agenda and at the top of our agenda. I mean, cost control is absolutely key. But without a doubt, um, to really make um, advances in, um, in reducing our carbon emissions, uh, it's going to cost money. Um, and for us, you know, we, we're just in the process of really understanding um, the materiality of that in our business models and our acquisitions and building that in. And it's not, it's not yet filtered into valuations, but that, you know, that inev is inevitability about that. Um, so it's really working with them. Um, with, with, with their occupiers um, to understand their business models. And we've got, you know, retailers of all shapes and sizes within the portfolio, all of them on, on different stages of their own um, environmental journeys, some of them yet to start and others, you know, well advanced. So it's, it's really trying to support one another, learn from one another um, and trying to educate um, where we can and learn where we can to try and um, absorb some of the costs. And the costs will need to be picked up, you know, across the board and whether that's um, you know, with government, um, with subsidies, with council, with subsidies, and whether that filters into possibly into rates, relief, etc. If you do fit outs, um, that you know that would be that would be beneficial, um, and occupiers, and of course um, uh, owners of real estate as well. I mean, re the real estate industry is one of the biggest contributors um, to carbon emissions. So um, legislation in itself is not a bad thing. It's going to have to happen. It's not going to be a nice to have. It's going to be absolutely fundamental to the sustainability of every business. That they're um, that they're engaged in this whole thing. Um, uh, I think we'll we'll move on to the tricky subject of uh, occupier owner negotiations and discussions in a minute. But but before we do, Chris, is there anything that you'd like to add on regulation and you know how effective it is, how what where it could be improved? Yeah, I think just the the, the future building standard. You know that that's coming over the horizon. Sort of you know we'll we'll see details of that. I guess twenty twenty four will be in law twenty twenty five. Um, and we've got this interim uh, step change in how we build. But of course, there's a lot of people building at the moment to, to current building regulations, perhaps forgetting that they're, they're going to have to be retrofitting those uh, to meet 2050. So uh, even with those interim step changes um, to building regs, um, I think the, the government favours a 27% 20, improvement CO2. You're still going to be retrofitting those before 2050. So it's, it's really interesting how the impact of... of the, the clarity of trajectory of change of, of the future building standard, the, the impact that's having on, on what, what clients are specifying to build. Um, because obviously, if you can over specify and go beyond building regulations now, you're saving yourself that future cost of upgrade and the upheaval and the vacant periods, well, you know, potentially while you're going to do that, that type of work. Um, so I think, you know, the, the, the trajectory of change for new builds is really clear. I think the the, the impact of Mies is interesting. You're, gonna, you're obviously, if, if everything coming through on new build is, is a much higher standard, there's going to be that, that increasing focus on what do we do about existing properties. And, uh, and I think the point's been made uh, by a few of the speakers. There are certain properties that you cannot upgrade, um, that you, you can't uh, realistically achieve you know, an EPCB uh, by 2030. Uh, and so I think we, we will see probably more interest in, in uh, you know, concerns about holding stranded assets, you know, assets that just really um, don't have a future. Um, so more disposals, more redevelopments probably coming as a result of that legislation. I think also we will be, you know, technology will, will continue to improve until there'll be real advances in that in the coming years. And, um, you know, from our perspective, that's something we're looking forward to and very much aware of that, um, you know, with the, with the emphasis on this whole area, that will also drive um, technological changes and, uh, and greater efficiencies. So um, we welcome all of that. Just to pick up a point that, that Greg made about things like PV, this is where government needs to be a bit more joined up because clearly we've got the rating consultation, which we hope to hear from later mm. this year. 
but adding PV to your building adds a plant and machinery addition. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive to the government's agenda to, to penalise investment in that way. So it'd be good to see a bit more of a joint of approach from government about how they can a, incentivize these things without uh, giving with one hand and taking with the other. I agree. There's an opportunity here, I think, when you're talking about EPCs and, and the, the regulations framework, there's a move towards understanding of real in-use operational energy consumption and you know thinking to the workplace sector and the work of the better buildings partnership with things like design for performance and neighbors it, that that whole model i think could readily be applied to the retail environment there is complexity i think understanding between tenant side and landlord side where there are mixed systems but you know what, what a landlord has opportunity is to provide a system that will decarbonize with time you know take for example installation of um, an ambient loop type Peak network currently connecting to the, the grid. As the grid decarbonizes, that system will also decarbonize and will meet points along the way. And, and that's where a new development maybe has more opportunity than existing. And to that point around you know, stranded assets, maybe that's where councils have a role to play in purchasing those assets and transforming them into new opportunities for you know, town and city centers. Thanks. Um, and We've, we've touched on this already, but obviously making all of this happen uh, is going to um, require that owners and occupiers work a lot more closely together than they have done perhaps in the past. And so let's, let's, let's consider for a while how well do current leasing arrangements and incentives, etc., support retail property in becoming more energy efficient. And I know from uh, separate conversations, Rob, that, that you've got some uh, strong views on this, um, and then perhaps we'll go over to Emma for a property owner's perspective. Yeah, I mean, the, this is really coming out of the rise of the, the green lease clauses, and, and this is really now coming into its own when we're doing lots of lease renewals. Um, as does, as I've reiterated, got a really strong ESG agenda. You know, we've um, pretty much completed LED lighting across our entire estate. Over the last 10 years, we've reduced our energy consumption and refrigeration alone by 30%. And lighting's the next big item uh, on our consumption list. The, the types of green lease clauses I'm seeing come through, though, all want to obligate the occupier to reduce its consumption. And, and the issue and the struggle, I think, that we've got as an industry with any occupier type is actually we don't know what technology is coming down the line. We don't know where prices are going to go. And it might actually be more beneficial in the future to increase consumption on one sort of utility to decrease it on another. So there's the types of clauses which suggest that you shouldn't increase any consumption across any utility line don't really seem to think about the long-term position of, of the owner or the use of the building. So these are the sorts of things that we, we're getting uh, pushed our way. But I do think that occupiers should all cooperate with landlords and, and assist them to so that they can report their own ESG agenda. So we assist our landlords in reporting consumption numbers mm -hmm. for electric, gas, water, uh, and even waste to that degree. But I, I've got that's where I think that it should really cease and it should cease to be an obligation at least and more be of a cooperation position that we all want to get to. So I do think there are mixed goals here um, as well because clearly our our we invest in uh, incentives and uh, that will reduce the cost of continued consumption. And that's all to the benefit of our customers. So we can reinvest that, that saving in price. So we're already on that journey as well. I just don't think the, quite the green lease clauses as drafted I've seen quite get us there. And, and Rob, what sort of range of approaches have you seen from property owners to this? Yeah, there's a range of approaches from absolute obligations to cooperation clauses and uh, and everything in between. Uh, and I do think that the obligations are probably not really well thought through. I think they probably meet the fund objectives rather than the occupier objectives at this point. And we really need to think carefully about what those objectives are trying to achieve long term. Emma, some thoughts? Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to agree with Robert. Um, uh, you know, having anything that's mandatory um, definitely feels more you know, is sometimes something that's an obligation is generally pushed back on because it's um, um, by the nature of a lease um, flexibility and um, it's still very important to both parties I guess but 
where, where this is concerned and where we are coming from is um, it's just trying to collaborate more. And but, but what we are experiencing is generally is a, is a lack of um, a lack of willingness um, to actually kind of sign up for it, which is which is one aspect of it, and you know, agree to it in a lease. But in actual fact, um, in the reality of it, is that many retailers are beginning to share their data with us and their, their sources, so they're they're not willing to commit to it on paper, but they are. Um, by the nature of the relationships we have with the retailers, actually beginning to share some data with us, and that's been a big focus of our our own program over the last. It was, you know, really just hoped to get going more collaboratively two years ago in terms of sharing data, and um, it was kind of kicked back um, last year. We didn't think asking for meter reads in the middle of the pandemic um, <laughs> when they were either shutting or reopening shops would, would, would be helpful. So um, we have re-engaged in all of that, um, you know, more recently. Um, and we've had a good response from, from a number of retailers and actually surprisingly from some a lot smaller retailers and some of the independents particularly who are very engaged with the, um, with the environment and their whole businesses. But it's also surprising um, where a number of the bigger listed retailers are and, um, and, and not really, it's not really doesn't appear to be high on their agenda. And I guess for a retailer, there are whole other aspects of, of, um, of ESG and their supply chains in particular, which are, which are very challenging. Um, so real estate is possibly just slightly further down their, their kind of pecking order. But from our from our from where we're coming um, from, we you know we have to do all this um, for all the right reasons, and whether that's the social aspect or the environmental. Um, it's absolutely embedded in our in our business model, and for us to continue to be an investable business um, from our shareholders and our investors' perspective, this has to be top of our agenda, and we have to work with our with our occupiers. And you know, retailers don't want to own their real estate. They, they they're retailers. They want to retail from their real estate, but they need uh, a liquid and a reliable and solid business that owns that asset for them to be able to to, to run their business. So. Hopefully, that whole collaboration piece and the understanding of a, a, commune, a communal um, agenda on this environmental aspect will, will filter through, and it will it will need to get tighter in leases. But it would be nice to see an acceptance of it being a, tight, a tightening, um, and not just the reality of them, them sharing data, but actually, you know, it would be nice for them to put some, you know, try and put some obligations on us to, to share information. But we don't get any of that at all from any retailers looking to try and, and increase the agenda. From our from our side at all, we're not seeing that yet. I'll be careful what I wish for. Should <laughs> for just on, on, on on that subject, then we are going to revisit the second question of the poll that we put up earlier. Um, this time, panelists are allowed to vote. Um, so, um, Gail, if we could have that, please. And, and apologies to those who completed it earlier. Uh, if you wouldn't mind clicking through again, that would be great. Just while we wait for the results of that to come through, Rob, would you mind taking one of the questions that we've had, which is, are ASDA's partnerships with McDonald's, Decathlon, et cetera, are they sublets? You know, what, what's the contractual arrangement there and is there a turnover link and how do they compare with, I guess, normal retail leases? There's, there's a range of commercial um, terms in place and it, it really it's really down to suit the retailer and, and ASDA. So I probably can't go into much more detail than that. But um, we're, happy, we're very happy to work with partnerships on, on many terms. Okay, thanks. Um, Gail, can we have the results up now, please? Chris and Greg, what, what view do you take on green leases, green lease clauses, how these could be improved? Well, I mean, if I can start, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm the lawyer on the panel, but I'm not a property lawyer. I mean, what I hear from my colleagues is, is clauses go in and then get struck out quite quickly. Um, and, and people don't push too hard on it. And I suppose clients on both sides of the fence um, need to perhaps give better instructions to their professionals that this is something they do want to consider and they do want these type of uh, provisions in, in leases to, to flow both ways. Um, you know, what we hear uh, from our teams is that you know, the data sharing one is generally acceptable um, and seen as positive. positive. But, but clearly taking it to its logical extension, you know, you're, you're expecting a... Uh, a tenant to allow a landlord to come in and give them some ideas you know it, it's very much blurring the traditional landlord tenant relationship uh, and it does need that sort of change in mindset um, for it to actually work in practice i think from my perspective you know i, I answered broadly helpful um, i also think that the term green lease is very unhelpful I, I think it's it's just a lease agreement, and the, the the word green I think has some in some views negative connotations. So actually, branding it differently could help 
outcomes if it's just called the lease agreement or a collaboration agreement or you know a symbiotic agreement um, and, and that's the approach we took you know with Westgate Oxford uh, where we agreed with with the retailers there to you know work with the Crown Estate and Landsec as, as the the landlords in achieving the sustainable outcomes that Centre is seeking to achieve. Yeah that's, that's a very valid point Greg I mean I tend to agree I think um the whole um, the whole labelling of ESG um, is, is, is almost um, well, less so now, but very much box ticking a number of years ago, and um, and for us, as I said, I mean the social side of um, of New River and, and the community focus we had has been absolutely part of how we've operated from from day one, um, but the environmental aspect, um, you know, businesses don't really have a choice on this anymore. It is the absolutely the right thing to do, and it shouldn't be a box ticking exercise or or um, you know, whether you, you opt in or opt out, it should just be part of every agreement. It's how businesses, and it's, it's it's going to be the defining factor in many businesses going forward is how embedded this is in their business because it's a sustainable way forward. Um, and whether that's, you know, it, particularly into funding, um, you know, the, all the banks, et cetera, there's, there's green finance available. I suspect the green element will, that, that will drop off and it will just become a, a requirement for funding. That you're mm -hmm. actually aware of you've got the visibility and the materiality of all these aspects in your business and whether that's you're a retailer or an, or an owner of, re, of assets is that you're, you're aware of the implications of this going forward and that you're, that you're, you're addressing it and you're building it into your business models from day one and so i think i think you're absolutely right i think that the green labeling isn't helping because it still looks as though it's an option around yes. it and uh, and that's it that is that is you know closely it, you know very rapidly um, disappearing it's just going to be you know go back to it being fundamental mm -hmm. so that's a very interesting point and it's a, a question you know we, we've touched on the sort of principles that owners and occupiers should be working uh, collaboratively on to, to, to get where we want to get to and, and what it's reasonable for owners and occupiers to expect from each other do, do we feel that the government needs to step in in any way to change things or accelerate change? Yeah, you know, I, I guess I'm thinking particularly around leases and whether the government needs to be more directive in, in the sort of uh, sustainability linked powers and provisions that, um, that are in them. And who'd like to tackle that particular poison chalice? I think it's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, one size fits all. You know, whatever the government came up with, it wouldn't be right. So uh, I, I'd say no, but it, it's it's probably for um, for landlords with their professional advisors to 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 think about what they're trying to get out of the relationship and recognising that leases need to be flexible and cover changing relationships as time go, goes on. So I think probably investing in your documents uh, and not just rolling out the lease you've you've used for the last ten years is probably a start. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the 54 Act, another, you know, a thorn in the flesh of owners of real estate in the sense that, you know, with, with, with right to renew leases, occupiers then continue in the space that they're in um, perpetually without really investing in them. And we've seen, I mean, the nature of our estate, I think probably in the last 10 years, the only retailers I've seen strip out units completely and refit them from scratch are the likes of Primark or, or JD Sports. Otherwise, virtually every other retailer reuses what's been re you know the fit out that's been in there before um and that again uh, the, the kind of repurposing and reusing of of them um, of fit outs is a positive thing in, in, in one sense but when there's ME involved um, and it's been there a long time it's not it's not helpful um from from an environmental or an epc perspective so you know the, the, the 54 act again that that's not helpful that's obviously under review at the moment um but but environmental aspects of them um, of the of the challenges that we all face I'd like to think are being fed into and being considered by government um, as part of that process. Uh, similarly, with the rates review that's ongoing, is how we can um, incentivise owners and occupiers to um, to invest in this area um, and and receive some recognition for it and some incentive to do it um, before it becomes mandatory. I'd just like to uh, remind panelists that we do still have a, a question. Um, I'm going to come to that probably at the end of the session, but if you want to start thinking about what you'd do if you were Secretary of State for the day uh, to make a difference in this area, then, then please do. But before we get on to that, we're going to look at you know, the, the other big question, which is who's going to pay for all of this, because making retail property more energy efficient will cost some money. 
how do we determine who's best placed to bear these costs, you know, particularly when, as we've already mentioned, swathes of the sector are going through financially quite challenging times? You know, what's, what kind of fairness considerations are there here and, and, and how do we get to a sustainable answer? I'm happy to, to start off that conversation. Thinking about costs more broadly, I think Rob, to your earlier point about uncertainty on, on future costs of utilities, the government has started to signal, I think, how electricity prices may change in future and how gas prices may have to increase in future and, and, a, and a change in approach and how there are tariffs and taxations applied on those utilities. So it's conceivable, therefore, that electricity may cost less in the future. It's expensive now, but, but may cost less. Retail landlords can offer a compelling position where it's both low carbon and low cost operationally to take a space. Those are the spaces retailers will naturally want to occupy. And then if that's layered on with, here, here are the experiences that this place offers society. It's not just about consumerism anymore. It's about the experiences we have in going to places then that seems to suggest a competitive advantage. So whilst there may be costs in investing in, let's say, for example, on-site electric driven heat pumps with PV and batteries to offer the low cost, low carbon solution, over the long term, that investment may safeguard the business. I think it's really challenging to try and apportion costs in such an arbitrary way like this. I mean, Astor invests in its infrastructure because it's the right thing to do for its customers, because it will save money long term, which can be reinvested for the benefit of the customer. So th these are the these are the different decisions the businesses need to make based on their own internal uh, ESG criteria. I think where this gets really difficult is the is where government regulation suggests that it will stop you occupying a property. Um, if it's not the correct grade. And I'm not clear if that interferes with the 54 Act or not at this point, maybe um, a discussion for another uh, time. But the, this is where government regulation gets very difficult as well with existing occupiers to almost point on the 54 Act protection. So all I think we can, all I think I can say is that um, businesses invest for the right reasons. And if government can incentivize that, uh, maybe like they are doing this year with the, um, the super deduction tax, Maybe that's the way to go. Maybe possibly back to sort of whole scale tax reform. They need to think about how they can incentivize more green measures without um, disincentivizing it on, on the other hand. So, I agree. I think some incentives around um, refurbishing um, existing buildings and you know the, the, the VAT support and new builds. Um, and maybe they should be read across into to refurbishments um, as well because. There are there are there are many buildings that um, you know that refurbish do have an ongoing lifespan and, and will continue to provide um, more than adequate um, provision in terms of uh, you know being having a home to whether it's a business or or, or whatever but it's um it's being incentivised to do that and um, and again I think that feeds into the whole wider agenda of repurposing and reusing um, and in town centres um, there's a lot of old space that is listed um, and and hence. We don't have the option just to go knocking it down as you would do on maybe on, a, on an industrial site, but um, it's it's incentivising um, actually taking those buildings forward into into into, you know, into a much more sustainable format for kind of future generations. Um, and also the whole the whole you know the whole car agenda and people being local and staying local, um, incentivising that and, and and making the town centres accessible and um that there's that, that, um, um, adequate and um, regular public transport networks and infrastructure is good that that you know that allow people to have an option of not driving cars um and that that you know that all feeds into the same agenda doesn't it so support in those areas um in in um, public transport and infrastructure um and the repurposing of of um, attractive older buildings um i think is, would be really helpful I'm hearing that this is a much bigger question than how to repay for sustainable retrofit, um, which, which is, you know, it, it, it makes sense. And um, you know, clearly buildings are parts of places and you can't really separate the two. Um, we're going to, to start wrapping up soon. Chris, before we do so, any, any thoughts on this area? Well, just on that, that point, I mean, it, it, you know, we've said it a few times in this session uh, and it will probably, you know, I'm stealing from my going away thoughts, but it's just the level of um, government support um, and incentives. What, what we've tended to see recently is a chopping and changing in policy support. Um, and they tend to be very short term or capped. So it's very hard to build uh, you know, a, a business plan that's gonna take government support money and, and, and some of your own money to do some of these works. It's very hard to, to plan for that, that changing policy. 
and the other side of that is obviously people trying to create finance products. You know, we, we had a, the era of rooftop PV, you know, and sort of rent a roof models and things like that. It, again, it's very hard to create those type of models if you're constantly facing a shift in government policy. Um, so I think, you know, what we need is some consistency on policy and some fixing of policy uh, in, in the medium term so that people can create models. And I think there will be finance products. You know, we, we already get involved in sort of energy performance contracts where people go into a, you know, do a whole building refurb. You know, you, you, you've got the this, this scenario where tenants are paying the energy companies money and, and an element of that money, that pay as you save, could, could, be, could be used to finance some of this up, upgrade. Um, but again, it, it all relies on policy being consistent and we're not seeing that currently. Can I take that your that that to be your answer for if you were Secretary of State for the day? What one thing would you do? Consistent policy. Yes, yes, consistent policy and a bit of long range forecasting would help. I think. Thanks. Um, well, on, on on the subject of uh, if you were uh, Secretary of State, then um, maybe Greg and uh, then uh, Rob and Emma. I've been thinking about that since it landed. For me, I think I would give greater clarity to that point I was making around the costs and tariffs and utilities between gas and electricity. Electricity as of today is a, is a better, more carbon efficient source of energy than gas, but it costs three times as much as gas. There's a disincentive there. So I think I would remove some of the barriers to uptake of electricity. Um, maybe think about where taxation could be levied elsewhere to support the renewal of the grid. And one of the key barriers around electricity use is around the need for new primary substations. So uh, linked to that would be the ability for the network to speculatively invest in developing out the network and, and creating capacity now rather than waiting for applicants who often cost a lot of money to create the primary substations attached to new development. I think I think if I was Secretary of State, I'd be looking at really the reuse agenda. I think that's that's quite important. And we talked about that in buildings, but also in, in everyday life. So we're looking at how we can repurpose things rather than just throw them away. And the current current policy really doesn't always uh, focus on the value of a reuse it sometimes promotes a throwaway um, society in some cases so uh, we'll be looking at that to be honest and, and shaping some policies off the back of it which also work for property if it was in the seat for the day um i think it's um it's about incentivizing um particularly as, as, as rob touched on in the repurposing of, of existing space um, because that's obviously generating a lot of emissions um whereas people actually have an option if they're, if they're building from scratch um, they, they do have an option to build um, very efficient buildings now, and many, many people are. Um, so it's incentivising um, the repurposing, and um, and whether that's you know a number of years ago there was incentives to homeowners about installation in their in their attics, etc. All of those um, initiatives, I think, um, to get it from grassroots up, and also to simplify the communication of the whole agenda. I think it's still sort of veiled in sort of complexity and science and etc. And I think a lot of it um, could be simplified for for small measures by lots of lots of small businesses and individuals and bigger businesses. And for business like ours, um, you know, it comes with an awful lot of responsibility, but that's that's an opportunity. And we take that very seriously as um, an owner of real estate and particularly in communities up and down the country. So I think anything that incentivizes us uh, and our occupiers to try and move the needle, um, it would be, would be what I would focus on. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, I mean, that, that feels like a, relative, a fairly natural place to wrap up the discussion. Um, before we do so, is, is there anything... Uh, panelists that uh, we haven't covered today that you think we should have covered and and also to our audience um are there any questions that you would like to have answer uh, asked that haven't yet done so i've got i've got one that um we didn't really cover any details obviously the the impact of the changing legislation on electric vehicles and you know and, and, the, and the banning of uh, petrol diesel vehicles after after 2030 mm -hmm. Uh, and obviously, we're, we're still awaiting the, the results of the government's consultation on the obligations to put in EV charge points in new and existing buildings. But I think, um, you know, everybody in the retail sector will be interested on how electric vehicle charge points start becoming part of uh, the shopping experience and how they can be used and, and where they should be installed. And I think from a tenant's point of view, um, you know, you, you'll, you'll want your landlord to be putting EV charge points in car parks because, you know, your, your customers will expect to be able to charge while they're where in the shop. That's very true. I mean, it's interesting. We've, we've got EV charging points um, in virtually all our assets. We've got um, um, many of them. They're not in. They're being they're being um, they're being worked on. But um, interesting. One of our retail parks uh, recently, one of their our lettings to an occupier actually entails is implementing thirty charge points. 
Um, and my goodness, that's a step change that actually someone has stipulated um, that they want to see EV charging points. Um, and we already did have some, but you know, that sort of um, the volume of that um, and, the, and the request coming from from a retailer is the first we've experienced of that. So you, you know, it's going to continue to to be right on the agenda, um, which is you know, which is good, and, and that's. That's engaging with us to try and deliver, you know, a service for the customer, um, which then feeds into the sustainability of their business and our business. So, you know, that's what we're all trying to achieve. So the difficulty, Emma, that uh, which your, your tenants identified is that leases, uh, as was, and that's is my point about green lease clauses, don't support the implementation of EV charge points typically no. because Good you may need a substation granted, uh, which is a way lead, you're going to need alterations, consents. So this is, we, uh, when we do lease renewal, we try and future-proof this into our, our renewal leases for exactly that, that point. Uh, but we've recently rolled out 18 uh, fast charging points across West Yorkshire in partnerships with, uh, with Leeds City Council. So, you know, it is something which is on people's agenda and something that we, uh, we're, we're trying to um, lead on. Lead on. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And I was going to say there, you can imagine more places offering free charging as part of the offer. You know, come to this destination, we'll give you free charging. I think Lidl may have done something similar in some of their stores. You know, come to a shop with us and, and whilst you're here, you can top up your car for free. But nothing's ever free, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite right. somebody, somebody is paying the bill. It's like free car parking. A car park is never free. It costs a lot of money to run a car park. Um, so, uh, you know, therein lies the challenge. Indeed. Good. Well, on that note, um, I think we'll we'll wrap things up for today. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's tuned in. Thank you very much to our panelists, and hope you have a good rest of the day, rest of the week, and yeah, good to see you all. Thanks. Mm -hmm.